Okay, so it's the night before surgery. The transplant's in the morning. Everyone's left, uh, no one to visit with anymore, so you just have some time to sit and think about your thoughts and what this day's finally gonna mean to you that you've waited for for so many years. There's no other field where you instantly change someone's life. You take them from death's doorstep to a brand new lease on life. You look at them and they go from absolute despair to unbelievable hope. And you don't just change that person, you change their entire family, their entire community, all of a sudden benefits. You can't name, in my opinion, a field that does that better. There's nothing you can do that's gonna ever be as exciting and as amazing and as impactful as transplant. Since 1968, the University of Alabama at Birmingham has performed more than 14,000 transplants, making it one of the busiest transplant centers in the country. The university has pioneered new medications, advanced research, and improved surgical techniques while serving some of the country's poorest and most marginalized patients. If you want to take care of patients, don't put up obstacles. Nobody wants to be sick. If they're sent from Arkansas to Alabama to have a transplant, treat them right, make it easy. And I learned that from Dr. Kirkland. He did it so well. In 1966, the UAB Department of Surgery was searching for their next chair, but many leading candidates were wary of coming to Birmingham which was engulfed in racial unrest that was being broadcast into living rooms across the entire country. But an innovative doctor named John Kirkland was looking for a new challenge. Kirkland had revolutionized cardiac surgery at the Mayo Clinic by performing the world's first series of open heart operations using a heart-lung machine. To the surprise of many, he chose to come to a young institution in the Deep South, UAB. When Dr. Kirkland left the Mayo Clinic to come to Birmingham. It was a major shock around the country. UAB was uh, very raw, but had a huge amount of potential. Joe Volker was, a, was an absolutely charismatic man who had tremendous vision. And so I think he trusted that this place could give him the freedom, which he would not have at the Mayo Clinic, to mold something in an image which perhaps could take some of the attributes of the Mayo Clinic, uh, but also allow him to put his own imprint on the development of the institution. Meanwhile, in Boston, Dr. Arnold Gill Detown was nearing the end of his fellowship in the laboratory of the famed Dr. Joseph Murray, who in 1954 performed the first successful kidney transplant at Peter Bent Brigham Hospital. Detown was eager to find a place where he could develop as a transplant surgeon. Dr. Kirkland was the first time I ever heard someone describe building a program as opposed to doing operations. After we talked the second time, I said, Dr. Kirkland, why do you want a transplant program? And he said, well, I think it's an important part of research, clinical care, and education. And I think it's important that a surgical program address the question and deal with it. Diethelm agreed and joined the UAB faculty in 1967. Together, he and Kirkland went about securing the resources and building the infrastructure to establish the first transplant program in the Southeast. It's one thing to have vision, and some people never go anywhere with vision. Nothing happens. Other people have ideas and make them come true. And that's what Dr. Kirkland did. I don't know what wasn't going through my head at that time. I mean, the first thing, of course, that goes through my head, am I about to die 10 days before I get married? We thank you, Father, for bringing Austin to this time and Emily too. Father, we see how you have just 
work a mighty miracle, Father, just bringing them together. Um, then throughout this last year, in the first year of marriage, Father, I know it's been hard on them. It's hurt all of our hearts to watch. The well, spring of 2018 was when I was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease. And I mean, if that didn't hit me like a truck, I don't know how to describe it, man. If there was a light at the end of that tunnel, it was a long way away. So we talked with a bunch of dialysis nurses and starting with our journey, and they all from the start, UAB, I mean, that's what they said. If you wanna get a living donor, you need to go to UAB. As soon as you get started with the transplant process, you realize it's not just a nephrologist over here, an A surgeon over here, the nephrologist telling the surgeon what to do, and then the surgeon telling the nephrologist how it went. You see them working together all the time. You know that they're talking to each other. And just knowing that they're asking as many people as they can for their opinion on a subject matter that regards my health, I mean, that's, uh, that's as great as it can get. So tomorrow is our kidney transplant surgery. I am a match to give Austin, my husband, a kidney. And um, right now we're just basically waiting for tomorrow. He's all admitted into the hospital just for the night and I'll be here in the morning to be admitted as well. And we'll just go through with the surgery and we'll each have a working kidney by the end of it. So it'll be a good day. It's kind of a, a fresh start, a new start for us. I mean, we've been married for a little over a year now, but it's been a year of, you know, having kidney failure and going through dialysis and transplant lists and evaluations. And it just is going to give him a new outlook on life. And it's just a clean slate for both of us, really. Transplantation turned out to be a very important part of surgery. But it was a clinical experiment. Nobody knew it would work. Dr. Joseph Murray's kidney transplant in 1954 had been a success. But not all patients have an identical twin for a donor, and subsequent transplants from unrelated donors often failed. Some colleagues, citing the poor survival rates, were critical of Murray and other transplant surgeons. Back in the 1960s, renal transplantation was still in its infancy. So were there still lots of hurdles to overcome? Dr. Um, Deedham would also would oftentimes say that the most common transplant done was putting a kidney in and the second most common transplant was taking them out. People today, you know, you fret, you got 96, 94% survival, they were happy to get 50% survival. So it was a whole different day and you had to have this fortitude to really push through and do these transplants under a lot of uh, the glare of people and like should you even be doing this because a lot of people at that time thought this was experimental and should you really be experimenting on people putting these organs in how long they're gonna last people in Alabama were suspicious of organ transplantation they didn't really think too much of it the other problem was there was no method to procure kidneys from deceased patients, not only in Birmingham, but in the state. And nobody really had much interest in any part of it, which was both good and bad. Um, I remember the statement, we want to help you in every way we can. They had no space, no money, and no people. I didn't know any other way to get help but those three areas. So I decided we'd do it ourselves. Within a year of Deedhelm's arrival, the team was ready to perform the first kidney transplant in Alabama. Hollis Milton Lucas, a Navy veteran, needed a kidney transplant and his brother came forward as a suitable living donor. Lucas would be the first of what is now more than 10,000 kidney transplant recipients at UAB. I was a sophomore in college in 1967 and of course as most people know 
Christian Barnard really electrified the world on December 3rd, 1967, when he performed the world's first human-to-human -human heart transplant. Bernard's transplant had been a revelation, but mortality rates remained dismal. 85% of patients died following the procedure, largely due to organ rejection. In 1970, the American Heart Association called for a moratorium on heart transplants. It would be a decade before heart transplant surgery would take off again. It was clear organ rejection would need to be reckoned with in order to expand the field and help the growing number of patients in need. But then something came which changed everything, and that's the drug cyclosporin. I believe that we were the first program in the Southeast then to get into heart transplantation with the advent of cyclosporin. And we literally had patients lined up, and we activated a patient the day that, that the FDA approved cyclosporin for use in, in transplantation. We really felt like, uh, like we were in a, in a pioneering stage. New information was being generated literally every week. For many years, I mean many years, there was so much concern about how many hours can you actually take a heart and deprive it of oxygen and have it work again. I mean, it was, by today's standards, it was insane. We'd be at the donor hospital, we'd take the heart, our organ procurement people would orchestrate when the helicopter would be there, and then we'd be racing out, running down hallways. I mean, literally running down with those big cooler with heart, kidneys, etc. And then having telephone calls to try and make things as closely coordinated back to the recipient hospital, and then running into the operating room and thinking, okay, now the clock's really going. With these advances, UAB was no longer limited to kidney transplants. Heart, liver, and pancreas transplants would become routine. Now the nationally ranked transplant center, one of the busiest in the U.S., performs more than 400 transplants annually. My heart journey began in 2010. I had just finished out my workout at the gym, and it was on my drive home that I began to have a burning sensation in my chest. And all I wanted to do was lie down thinking that whatever this was would simply pass, but it did not. We started our way on to the hospital. Before we made it to the hospital, I suffered a heart attack when I woke up. I was on the gurney headed to the operating room. And my thoughts at that time was, will I make it? Will this be the last time that my family see me? My heart was failing. And so I was admitted to the hospital four months after having the bypass surgery. One of my heart doctors came by and shared the most unthinkable news. I was told that I needed a heart transplant. It was an out-of-body experience for me. At age 53 is when all of this happened, and it was a point of my life where we were selling. We had no children to, to raise anymore. My husband and I were able to travel. I enjoyed my job. We were cruising, and having this happen to me was just out of the blue. I could not believe it. This was a waiting game for me. I was called to the hospital actually six times before finding the match for me. And each time that I was called, it was devastating to me. It was on that sixth call when my cell phone rang, it was my transplant nurse, Allison. I knew without a doubt that that was the heart that God had for me. The doctor came in and said, that they were testing the heart, but the heart may not be any good. And so uh, my family got together in the hospital room and they began to pray. And as they prayed, 
The doctor came in and said the heart was good. That Dr. Curtin looked at it in a second eye and said it was good. And so I got my second chance at life. If you look throughout medical history and how do we define what drugs work for whom, there have been several notable groups left out where the majority of patients enrolled in clinical trials have been white or Caucasian with very little, if any, minority representation. And we know that there are genetic differences and so understanding what medications work um, becomes really important. Historically, African Americans had not done as well um, with their kidney transplants for a multiplicity of reasons, but with the advent of more potent immunosuppressive medications, uh, their outcomes have improved dramatically. Dr. Diethelm had brought in uh, some, some remarkable young surgeons that were very interested not only in good clinical care but also research. We were all excited about what we were doing and we were doing exciting things. The very first patients in the world to receive, transplant patients to receive mycophenolate were at UAB. UAB was a good place to do trials because the physicians all bought into the idea of us being involved because we were all excited about the new agents and we wanted to be part of the development. And because we have a diverse population that offered a broad range of patients to the trial that many of the other centers didn't have. Given the numbers at UAB, the experience of UAB with mycophenolate, all the companies began coming to UAB uh, to test the drugs. Our goal at UAB is to take care of anyone who comes through the door. We don't worry about race, color, creed. We're here to take care of people. We just happen to be in an area that where kidney failure is um, endemic with diabetes and hypertension being rampant among African Americans. They are disproportionately affected with kidney disease. More than half our list are African Americans, even though African Americans make up 28% of the population. So having a disproportionate amount of disease is, is onerous. So that's one reason that we've been so focused on disparities research to try to find answers that everybody else is trying to find. When Dr. Diethelm came um, in the um, mid to late 60s, and if you looked in the Deep South, Alabama didn't um, stand out uniquely for difficulties in managing chronic illness. The issues of hypertension, cardiac disease, diabetes, and renal failure were existent throughout the Deep South, Mississippi, Georgia, Northern Florida, Tennessee. And yet, there was probably no place in our country in the midst of this problem that sought to address it quite like UAB. And one of the things with Dr. Deedhelm, uh, which I admired and still admire, was that he was going to transplant anyone. In the 1960s, there were, as everyone knows, there were the racial issues, uh, especially in Birmingham, but he didn't care. Coming from New York, he was going to transplant who he wanted to transplant. And his courage to do that in the face of all that negativity um, put UAB on the map. When I walked on 7 South at UAB, uh, there were probably 25 patients at least on the service all the time. And they had seemed to have all sorts of complications and various things that were needing to be managed. And I was very critical of what I saw, that if you had been more careful, you wouldn't encounter these sorts of things. Dr. Deerhoy had just arrived as young faculty at that point in time. After I felt comfortable with him, uh, after a couple of months, I said, how can you do all these transplants without paying attention to matching and to all of these variables that I had learned in my background in Arkansas. And he looked at me and he said, if you have people on your list waiting for a kidney, how can you turn down any kidneys? That conversation stuck with me over the years and influenced profoundly my thinking about things. And that's what UAB did better than anybody else in the country. We got people transplanted. I think his attitude first to address the problem head on was crucial 
but his willingness to make sure that he made this available to everybody who was a part of this state was fundamental. Dr. Deedham sought to grow at that time the biggest kidney transplant program in the world. Consequently, if you look at that and say, boy, you were doing over 300 kidneys a year for several years with a large majority of them from minority background, he probably did more transplants on underrepresented minorities than any transplant surgeon or any program in the world. Patient care begins with the first time you talk to the patient. You sit down. Don't stand over them with a crew of 10 people, but sit down at the bedside and look at them and talk with them. Ask them where they're from. Did they come with their husband or their mother or father? Make them feel at home and be positive. Tell the family, I'll call you after the operation. The worst thing you can do is to not give them the time they need. There would be a tendency in some hospitals I've been that they spent more time with the well-to-do than people that didn't have much money. And I made sure it didn't happen here. What is the outstanding challenge now? Really major remaining challenges. The biggest problem now and it always has been in transplant. Organ shortage. Organ shortage. Organ shortage. Lack of organs. No question. You know, there are more than 100,000 individuals in the United States alone that are in need of a life-saving organ transplant. And we perform really fewer than about 20,000 a year. And so we know thousands of people die every year waiting to get that phone call to have a ch second chance at life. Organ shortage remains a problem uh, largely because of chronic disease and illness in our country. And Alabama is a poster child for some of the diseases that drive significant end organ damage. Hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease all relate to those problems that lead to the need for transplantation. Historically, the waiting lists at UAB have been in the thousands for organs, particularly for kidneys, largely because we have such uh, demand for treatment for these diseases and we have such disparities in our population. In 2013, in response to the enormous demand for kidneys in the state of Alabama, UAB began offering paired kidney exchange. The exchange began in December as the result of a selfless act of a non-directed living kidney donor, Helena native Paula King. During that month, eight more donors braved a rare Alabama ice storm to share the gift of life. The transplant team remained at the hospital until all patients were transplanted and safe. Today, that chain has reached 100 living donors, the nation's longest single-site kidney chain. We know that about half of all individuals who come forward to be living kidney donors will either not match their intended recipient, either because of blood group or tissue incompatibility. So that means right off the bat, we lose 50% of the individuals who would otherwise be willing to donate. And if you think about it, for every live donor transplant we can do, that frees up a deceased donor kidney for someone who does not have a live donor. I think if we could do that and sort of all come to terms with that, I think we could really revolutionize the way that we do transplant. Thank you all for coming. It's a really an exciting chance for us to talk about uh, ongoing developments for clinical excellence and research at UAB. We suffer from a number of challenges related to chronic disease, and one of them is organ donation. We still have nearly 3,000 and over 3,000 patients on our waiting list for organs. And this opportunity today to announce a partnership with United Therapeutics to allow us to be their center of excellence for xenotransplantation gives us a chance to do something that no other center in the world can do, becoming a leader in xenotransplantation, using organs from animals to eventually apply themselves to humans. We think that is potentially one of the next big leaps in transplant, and that's taking organs from genetically modified pigs and modifying them so they're at less risk of being rejected and allow more people to be transplanted. Um, 
before they get deadly ill. Uh, one of the advantages people probably don't realize about that is there's a lot of indications we don't do transplants on because there's not enough organs, but if someone has uh, an advanced liver cancer and you have a pig organ you can put them in and you buy them four or five years of quality life that you could transplant them. We think that could really revolutionize a uh, transplant. I had a man come in to tell me in clinic one day he had got a kidney when he was 55 and he'd had his kidney now for 15 years and he and his wife were preparing to spend the next few years traveling around the United States. And I asked him how to make a difference. <laughs> what he said was, thank you for making me an old man. When you're going through something so scary and not knowing whether you are going to make it or not, it was such a comforting feeling to know that they had my interests at heart. They wanted me to survive, and I did. There's no question that there has been an evolution in transplant over the years in terms of the technological advances, but at the end of the day, the breed has never changed. It's a certain type of personality that is tenacious, uh, that doesn't give up easily, that's extraordinarily disciplined and has the biggest heart you've ever seen. And I think that's transplant, and that's UAB.